Number one, the 24 elders. The Bible describes multitudes of beings that have intrigued many people for years. Who are the 24 elders beyond our understanding and perception? There is a splendid throne room in heaven, radiant with divine light and power. This place is extraordinary. It is where the most powerful being in the universe resides. John's journey to the island of Patmos and his subsequent visions, including those of the 24 elders, are among the most intriguing episodes in the Bible. Amidst the wonders of the supernatural realm, one particular presence stands out. A circle of 24 elders dressed in white, crowned with gold, seated on thrones around the main throne. Who are these figures? Why are they here? After addressing the seven churches, suddenly John found himself in the very throne room of God. He saw God seated on a throne resembling precious stones. Around this throne were 24 other thrones, and upon them sat the 24 elders. These elders wore white robes with golden crowns on their heads. The elders, along with the four living creatures around the throne, fell down before God, casting their crowns before him and declaring, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation 4 verse 1 There is no place in the book of Revelation where the identities of the 24 elders are detailed. On the other hand, it is highly likely that they are representatives of the church. Some believe they are angelic beings. However, this is highly unlikely. It is clear that they reign alongside Christ by virtue of them sitting on thrones. It is repeatedly proclaimed that the church rules and reigns with Christ. The Greek word translated as elders in this context is never used to refer to angels. It is exclusively used to refer to men who have reached a certain age and are capable of governing the church. Since angels do not age, the term elder cannot be attributed to them. Although angels may serve wearing white, the color white is more often associated with believers because it represents the righteousness of Christ attributed to us in salvation. The elders wear golden crowns, indicating they are not angels. Angels never receive crowns, and there is no evidence they wear them. The cherubim, living creatures, serve as motivation for the 24 elders to engage in worship, as the cherubim worship God continually, day and night. The elders are seen as representatives of God's people, particularly in the Old Testament. They are adorned with crowns of victory and have been moved to the place their Redeemer prepared for them. But first, to have a blessed and protected 2024, comment Amen here in the comments, and I will be leaving a heart in your comment continuing. Number 2. The Ophanim in the Old Testament, angels are referenced 108 times. In the book of Exodus, Moses also encountered angels during the wandering period in the desert. What are the Ophanim? The term Ophan in ancient Hebrew refers to wheels, but of particular interest are the wheels of God's throne mentioned in Ezekiel's vision. God chose to open the heavens before Ezekiel and timed the description of Ezekiel's inaugural vision, which is one of the most difficult passages to translate in the entire Old Testament. Ezekiel first tells where he was when he saw the vision. He tries to put into words something that couldn't be clearly explained, using similes to describe it, comparing it to other things to give an idea of what it was like. As Ezekiel watches a dark and menacing cloud of lightning and fire approaching from the north, within the cloud are four illuminated beings shining brightly. Before witnessing the Ophanim, Ezekiel saw creatures that were later identified as cherubim. After seeing the cherubim, Ezekiel saw the wheels, resembling the wheels of a chariot. The best object to imagine what Ezekiel saw is a gyroscope. Ezekiel was describing something that could move in any direction without needing to turn. Keep in mind Ezekiel was describing the indescribable. As he looked at the living beings, there was a wheel on the ground beside each of them, for each one of the four. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like the color of beryl, sparkling, and all four had the same form. Their appearance and work was as if a wheel were within a wheel. When they moved, they went in any of the four directions without turning as they moved. 
As for their rims, they were high and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them, and when the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction, and the wheels rose beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever those went, they went, and whenever those stopped, they stopped, and whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Ezekiel continued standing among the wheels and the cherubim. Wherever the cherubim went, the wheels went. He reported that the Spirit of God was manifest in everything that was happening. Ezekiel was also seeing the omniscience of God. The multiple eyes he saw represented God's complete awareness. He sees and knows everything. This great book begins with a vision in which Ezekiel receives a revelation from God about angelic figures. In this vision, God calls the prophet to be his spokesperson and watchman for the Hebrew exiles. This vision is the first of four in the book. It can be challenging to visualize what Ezekiel saw or expressed in this passage. The senses of excellent knowledge and intelligence, the Ophanim are also mentioned in a similar manner in Ezekiel 10. Ezekiel was supposed to understand that the chariot or throne chariot of God was in motion. The image may seem bizarre to the modern reader, but it should be remembered that this is a visionary experience and surrealistic features can overwhelm realism. Number three, the behemoth. Imagine a terrifying five-ton African elephant charging toward you with its trunk stretched out, dilated eyes and massive legs pounding the ground. There is nothing between you and it except flat grass and your heart is pounding wildly as you escape. Did you know that far more fearsome and powerful animals than African elephants have roamed the earth? The behemoth is seen in this great animal in the book of Job. It all began with a wealthy man named Job residing in Uz with his extensive family and vast flocks. He is upright and righteous, always striving to live a moral life. He had a very disciplined relationship with God. God extols Job's virtues to Satan but Satan argues that Job is only righteous because God protects him. Satan challenges God, saying that if given the green light to inflict suffering, Job will change and curse God. God allows Satan to torment Job to test this bold assertion, but prevents Satan from taking Job's life. Job receives four reports in one day, each informing him that his sheep, servants and ten children have died due to invaders, thieves or natural disasters. In the midst of his suffering, Job tears his clothes and shaves his head, but in his prayers he continues to praise God. Satan reappears in heaven and God gives him another chance to prove Job's worth, testing Job. He curses his birthday, comparing life and death, light and darkness. He wishes he had never been born and that his birth had been shrouded in darkness, feeling that life only adds to his agony. He wonders why God judges people based on their actions when God can quickly mend or forgive their actions. Job is perplexed as to how a human being can fully satisfy God's justice, given that God's ways are mysterious and beyond human understanding. Job is pushed to his breaking point by the trial and as a result becomes resentful, anxious and terrified. He laments the injustice of God, letting evil people thrive while he and many other honest men suffer. Job wants to confront God and protest, but he cannot physically find God. He thinks that wisdom is hidden from humanity, but resolves to pursue it, fearing God and avoiding evil. In the end, God decides to intervene. In 36 instances, Job prays to God to have a conversation with him. His wish is granted. Both occasions when God communicates with Job occur amidst a storm. There is much humor in the way God addresses him. God reminds Job that he is the creator of everything. He goes through his magnificent activity of creating and sustaining the world, asking Job if he could match that work. He ends by asking if Job is capable of judging, telling him that it is presumptuous for Job to believe that God should explain himself to him. Job is made to feel very small. Eventually, Job responds, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. 
I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. In the second round, God does not speak about himself as the creator, but about his creatures. The speech is full of humor. Once again, he asks Job for his opinions on the behemoth, as if these fantastic beasts held the answers to significant questions of life. Job 40 verses 15 to 19. See now the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength is in his loins, and his power in the muscles of his belly. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the eldest of God's paths. Only his creator can approach him with his sword. Previously, the focus was more on the enigma of animal creation, but now the focus has shifted to fear. And yet, the grandeur of divine creations, the identity of the Bimot. The Bimot is one of the few biblical creatures that scholars have debated for quite some time. The academic community is still trying to reach a consensus on many aspects of this creature, but they know two things. It was gigantic and had a navel. The presence of a navel indicates that it is not an oviparous animal. We read, he feeds on vegetation like an ox, his strength lies in the muscles of his stomach. God seems to delight in describing the wonder of this exceptional creature, highlighting its size, appetite and behaviors along the way. The picture is clear. If Job cannot rival his creature companion, how could he compete with the God who created the bimot? The Hebrew word bimot has the same form as the plural of the Hebrew word bima, which means beast. It is possible that such a beast roamed the earth alongside people. The bimot was a hippopotamus. Many people think that God had in mind what we call a hippopotamus, one of the largest, most powerful and dangerous terrestrial animals in the world. The hippopotamus was definitely known in biblical times, especially in Egypt. The Romans reduced its population due to the damage they caused to crops. Although called a river horse, the hippopotamus is more related to pigs than horses. The open mouth of the hippopotamus offers a compelling image. Or was the bimot an elephant? According to most biblical defenders, bimot in Hebrew refers to a quadruped beast that they believe to be an elephant. Those who favor hippos do so because Job 40 verse 23 speaks of the boat's enormous mouth drinking up the gushing Jordan River. Based on verse 19, it seems that the creature described in Job's story was too large for the people of that time to defeat. These descriptions cannot be attributed to any current animal. Throughout recorded history, humans have hunted and killed elephants and domesticated them for various purposes such as work and war. When the book of Job described the Bimot as the chief of God's paths, so powerful that only the one who made it can bring his sword near it, it was not an exaggeration, the Leviathan. Compared to the terrifying and uncontrollable power of the Leviathan, man's pride and greatness were nothing to boast about. The more humble man is in the presence of God, and that's the point. Neither Job nor anyone else has the right to criticize God's work. The Leviathan is a great aquatic creature of some kind. The Bible describes it as a frightening beast with monstrous fierceness and great power. The Hebrew word for Leviathan has the root meaning of coiled or twisted. Isaiah 27 verse 1 speaks of the Leviathan. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Whatever this sea monster may be, whether its strength and wild nature were well known, the sea beasts glorify God. The Old Testament contains several mentions of the Leviathan. According to most of these passages, the Leviathan is a real creature that people knew, although they kept their distance and only knew of it by reputation and not by sight. In Psalm 104, verses 25-26, God is praised as the one who created the habitat for the Leviathan. To counter Job's inflated image of himself, God wished to demonstrate to this man how small he was in the grand scheme of things. Using Job as an example, Job 41 gives the most detail about the Leviathan as a real sea creature. 
In this chapter, God describes the Leviathan, emphasizing the size, strength, and ferocity of the animal. Job 41 verses 1, 5. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you put him on a leash for your girls? This creature was first mentioned in Job 3 verse 8, that those who curse the day curse those ready to stir up Leviathan. In this context, Job refers to sailors and fishermen who cursed the threatening creature known as Leviathan. Similarly, with intense emotion, Job cursed the day he was born. Leviathan is generally considered a mythical sea monster or dragon that terrorizes sailors and fishermen. However, in the context of Job 41, God does not seem to consider Leviathan mythical. There are differing opinions on the description of Leviathan. Some suggest it could be an ancient dinosaur, akin to a dragon that may have survived into Job's time, or remained in humanity's memory, serving as an example for God to refer to. On the other hand, some believe Leviathan is simply a powerful crocodile. In this context, God's purpose in providing Job with this account of Leviathan is to demonstrate to Job how powerless he is before this creature. There is nothing Job can do to stop this mighty creature, the cherubim. The cherubim are a group of celestial beings created by God. They are the first of the angelic hierarchy to appear in the Bible, immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve. Genesis 3 records the events in the Garden of Eden. Having violated God's command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was likely that Adam and Eve would extend their hands and also take from the tree of life and live forever. As a result, they were expelled from their earthly paradise. But what would prevent Adam from returning to the garden and disobeying God again? The answer is given in this verse, Genesis 3 verse 24. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. From these two sources in the Bible, it seems that the primary responsibility of the cherubim is to declare man's sinfulness and to protect God's presence from sinful men. As much as Adam might long to return to the Garden of Eden, the cherubim reminded him that he had broken God's law. The high priest of Israel was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies once a year to behold the mercy seat. I'm sure he must have felt on each occasion, I do not belong here in God's holy presence, for I am a sinner. The cherubim are real and powerful beings. However, cherubim in the Bible often represented heavenly things. They were integrated into the design of the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle by God's order. The cherubim shown in Ezekiel 10 not only have wings and hands, but are also full of eyes, surrounded by wheels within wheels. However, Ezekiel also paints a grim tone in chapter 10, and the cherubim provide a clue. The cherubim did more than protect God's most holy place from those who had no right to be there. They also ensured the high priest's right to enter the holy place with blood, as the mediator of the people with God. The cherubim do not deny access to the throne to the humblest Christian. They assure us that we can come boldly because of Christ's work on the cross. The veil in the temple was torn, the morning star. The book of Isaiah 14 introduces us to a being known as Lucifer. Lucifer literally means the one who brings light in Latin. The word is translated as the morning star. In Hebrew, Lucifer was portrayed as a bright, shining, and wonderful deity in all languages, Melchizedek. Now we discuss the only human on our list, no character in the Bible more mysterious than the person of Melchizedek. When we first meet him, he is living in the time of Abraham. Even the name Melchizedek carries an air of mystery. He makes a quiet entrance into the canon of Scripture. Who is he? Why is there so much discussion about him? He is mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments. Our saga begins with a man known as Abraham, the authentic of his name. 
Many of us are not familiar with how names work in Hebrew and in the Bible. Names in the Bible are not just explanatory, they also carry authority. For example, the name God gave to Adam meant of the earth, describing Adam's origin. A name can sometimes be linked to the role of the named individual in the biblical narrative, as in the case of Nabal, a foolish man whose name means fool. Names in the Bible can express human aspirations and divine revelations, or they are used to exemplify prophecies. What is the meaning of the name Melchizedek? The name Melchizedek has notable significance in Hebrews 7 verse 2. It denotes king of righteousness or the king is righteous. This name suggests that the individual so named is just and upright in his actions. It is a fitting name for a leader or ruler who promotes justice and righteousness in his domain. Melchizedek is employed to elucidate the mysteries of Jesus. Just as Melchizedek is the monarch of peace, Jesus is also the monarch of peace. In the prophecy of Isaiah about the coming Messiah, he declares, The second piece of information about Melchizedek that we can extract from Genesis 14 is that he offered Abraham bread and wine, being a priest of God Most High, Genesis 14 verse 8. This indicates to us that he was a priest of God Most High. According to the sacred scriptures, there is only one God who is the Most High. This title belongs to the God whom Abraham worshipped. He alone ruled over all the gods and was the one before whom all gods should bow. The priesthood that Melchizedek possessed preceded the priesthood that Aaron and the Levites possessed. Melchizedek blessed Abraham by God Most High. Melchizedek acknowledged in Genesis 14 verse 20 that God Most High had granted Abraham the ability to defeat his enemies. The order and mystery of Melchizedek are used to illustrate Jesus, the man without beginning or end. The intriguing aspect about Melchizedek is that neither a beginning nor an end is ever attributed to him. This priesthood of Melchizedek was a priesthood that would endure until the end of time. Melchizedek in the New Testament. The reference to Melchizedek in the New Testament is in Hebrews. This chapter establishes comparisons between the priesthood of the Old Testament and the priesthood that the Lord Jesus now holds, Hebrews 6 verse 20, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The author refers to Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 provides us with more information about Melchizedek than any other passage in the Bible. The writer focuses on a specific incident during the encounter of Abraham and Melchizedek, Hebrews 7 verses 1 to 4. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom Abraham also gave a tenth part of everything, being first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now reflect on the greatness of this man to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tithe of the spoils. Abraham is considered the ancestor of the Israelites, the people of God, and held in high esteem because of his role. Despite this, Abraham submitted to the authority of Melchizedek and gave him a tithe of the spoils of battle. As great as Abraham was, he bowed before Melchizedek. We learn in verse 3 that Melchizedek had no ancestry, parents or genealogy, having no beginning or end of life. Also noteworthy is the fact that Melchizedek was like the Son of God. This is a very significant point, indicating that he is a type of an even greater priest, the Lord Jesus. His city, the city of peace, foreshadows the work of the Lord Jesus, who brought us peace. Abraham demonstrated his recognition of Melchizedek's priesthood by offering a tithe of all he possessed to God. It is evident from verses 9 and 10 that Abraham was a type of the future Levitical priesthood that was about to be established the angel of death. Perhaps we have heard of the angel of death, but what about an angel of death? There is a difference between the two.
This chapter appears in Exodus for those familiar with the Angel of Death. Because the Egyptians refused to release the enslaved Israelites, God sent several plagues upon them, the worst of which was the final plague. The final plague involves the Angel of Death. Exodus 11 verses 1 to 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people, that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. Moses returned to the royal chambers for one last interview with the king, Exodus 11 verses 4 to 5. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There had been conflicts in the past, and there will be in the future. Egypt had just suffered nine plagues, and more national calamities were to come, but there would never be another wave of sorrow like this one. As in previous disasters, the Hebrew population would be spared. There will be an exodus. I will punish Egypt, said God. Tonight, I will enter every house where there is no blood on the door. But at the doors of my people there will be blood, and they will be spared on that night. History was made because people trusted the man of God and followed God's plan. As a result, the Lord told them, Pharaoh refused to obey and, as a consequence, exposed himself and his people to the wrath of the Lord. The night when no one slept, Exodus 12 verses 29 to 30. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. He fulfilled his word. The destroying angel did not overlook anyone unprepared, not even the king. The deadly fingers of death struck like a dreadful calamity, but they did not touch any of God's people. The Word of God tells us that there was no residence in Egypt where someone had not perished. Reflect on that. What a terrible night that was. My mind cannot fully grasp it. What a night. A great multitude marched through the streets toward the border, while muffled cries and lamentations of the Egyptians echoed in the darkness. The Angel of Death is another term for the destroying angel. God employed angelic beings, celestial messengers of some kind, on various occasions to execute judgment upon sinners on earth. This being is referred to as a destroying angel in several Bible translations. There is no clear biblical evidence that a single angel was designated as a destroying angel or an angel of death. The most we can say is that references to a destroying angel in the Bible are to a celestial being or beings that came to destroy those under God's judgment. Instead of destroyer, some translations use angel of death or death angel. In Hebrews 11 verse 28, this being is referred to as the destroyer of the firstborn. Surprisingly, the original Hebrew text of Exodus 12 verse 23 does not mention an angel. It simply states that the destroyer, the one who causes damage or the one who causes harm, will kill the firstborn of Egypt. Psalm 78 describes the plagues in Egypt and summarizes them as being unleashed by a band of destroying angels. The Jewish word for messenger is used here, but it doesn't refer to a specific angel. God also sent a destroying angel, a celestial emissary, who brought desolation to judge the Israelites as a consequence of David's sin in numbering the people. From that moment until the end of the appointed period, the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 people died, from Dan to Beersheba. When the messenger stretched out his hand to devastate Jerusalem, the Lord repented of the disaster and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Araunah the Jebusite. 
When David saw the angel striking the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. What are seraphim? Seraphim are divine entities created by God to serve and worship. These six-winged angelic beings are constantly present at the throne of God. The prophet Isaiah tells us that seraphim are six-winged and incandescent angels who surround God as he sits on his exalted throne and are continuously devoted to God. Isaiah 6. The seraphim also minister to the Lord and serve as his agents of purification, as demonstrated by the cleansing of Isaiah's sins before he began his prophetic ministry. The term seraphim appears in the Bible only in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6 is the only passage in the Bible that uses the term seraphim, which means the burning ones. Isaiah describes his intense vision of God's heavenly court in that biblical chapter. The prophet specifically saw God sitting on a high and exalted throne, surrounded by flying angels known as seraphim. The implication is that these attending angels are in awe of God. Seraphim appear to have a human-like appearance, as Isaiah describes them as having faces, feet, and voices. Isaiah 6, 1, 2. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. These angels may appear as incandescent flames. The term seraphim derives from the Hebrew verb seraph, literally meaning to burn with fire, or more specifically, to destroy with fire. The name may also allude to the function of seraphim as agents of purification. God created the seraphim as sinless creatures, but they are not to be confused with God. The significance of the seraphim's proximity to God, combined with their revelatory praise, cannot be underestimated. When the seraphim say, the whole earth is full of his glory, they are giving a first-hand account of what emanates from the apex of heaven. We can see, from the supernatural perspective of the seraphim, that God's glory is infinite, indescribably valuable, and so powerful that it cannot be contained within a single realm. His glory overflows through heaven, unfolding through the spiritual realm and pouring out over all the earth. This revealed glory allows us to glimpse a holy God. To be holy means to be distinct and revered. This triple invocation of the word holy to describe God's sacred nature appears only twice in the Bible, both times by angels. Someone transported in vision to God's throne, and if the pure and holy seraphim show such reverence in the presence of the Lord, how much more should we, sinful creatures, approach Him? The reverence of angels for God should remind us of our own insolence when we rashly enter His presence as we often do, because we do not understand His holiness. In Revelation 4, John's vision of God's throne was similar to Isaiah's in reverence and awe, the holy living creatures gathered around the throne cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The seraphim also ministered to God and served as his agents of purification. When Isaiah perceived the celestial seraphim covering themselves before God to admit their unworthiness before the Lord, he became aware of his own mortal sin and feared for his life. At that point, one of the seraphim took a coal with tongs from the altar, brought it to Isaiah, and placed it on his lips. The seraphim assured Isaiah that his guilt was taken away and his sin atoned for as a result of this act. Demons are personal entities. It is clear that demons have attributes of personality. Both Christ and the demons themselves use personal pronouns, I, me, and your, when referring to each other. The demonic spirit within the possessed man, not the man himself, was responsible for demonic possession. Demonic possession occurs when a spirit resides in a human body and exhibits its own personality through the personality of the host body. Supposedly harmless practices of occultism, spiritism and others open the door to deception for believers and real demonic danger for unbelievers. People often engage in occultism or demonic things because something there seems to work. Unfortunately, it's not something in action, but someone in action, a demonic spirit. 
We can say that demons want to occupy bodies for the same reason a vandal wants a can of spray paint. A body is a weapon they can use to attack. Demons also attack men because they despise the image of God in man, so they try to disfigure that image by making man horrendous. Demons have the same purpose regarding Christians, which is to ruin the image of God, but their tactics are limited regarding Christians. Demonic spirits have been disarmed by Jesus' work on the cross. Although they can deceive Christians by ensnaring them with unbelief, demons also have personal names. Jesus asked the demon, what is your name? Luke 8.30. Jesus probably asked the demon's name to understand the full scope of the problem, knowing that the man was filled with many demons, not just one. We should note that legion is not a name. It was evasive, threatening, and intimidating. Demons speak and communicate. Speech demonstrates personality. Demons conversed with Christ, and Christ spoke with the demons. They begged him not to send them into the abyss. The demons inhabiting this man did not want to be confined in the abyss, which is the bottomless pit described in Revelation 9, 1. It seemed to be a place of confinement for certain demonic spirits. Demons exercised will and appealed to Christ not to cast them into the abyss, but to allow them to enter the pigs. Christ's authority over them is essentially a demand of his will over theirs, an order they had to obey. Demons have intelligence. Demons were aware of the identity of the Lord Jesus. One of them recognized Paul and the ministry he was leading. To a slave girl, the spirit also allowed her to ascertain confidential information through divination or fortune telling. Acts 16, 16, 17. Demons are spiritual entities. Demons are disembodied spirits. They are completely devoid of any material form. Demons belong to the spiritual world and their only manifestation is the trouble they cause. Some are more malicious than others. The Bible speaks of degrees of wickedness among demons. Jesus said he was casting out a demon when the demon came out. The word of God tells us that although Satan bound people, Jesus revealed his authority by overcoming his evil forces, freeing captives and dividing the spoil of Satan. Lucifer, a personality referred to as Lucifer, appears in Isaiah 14. The Latin root of Lucifer means the one who brings light, while the Hebrew translation is morning star. Lucifer was portrayed as a radiant, shining, and majestic being. In any language, he was a high-ranking angel. Lucifer was one of God's chief angels, along with Michael and Gabriel in God's heavenly hosts. However, at some point, Lucifer made a grave mistake. He challenged God. Luke 10.18 said to them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. As a master of slander or defamation, he continues to seek to undermine various forms of authority that God has established, both in the church and in the world. When Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he did not cease his rebellion, but continued to establish his own kingdom in opposition to the kingdom of God. Lucifer's heart was lifted up in pride because of his beauty, and that was the reason he was cast out of the Mount of God. What was Lucifer's initial motivation? What was the original sin? Pride. The original sin was committed in heaven, not on earth. It was not drunkenness. It was not adultery, not even lying. It was a matter of vanity, still the most fatal sin of all. Many temple goers would never dream of committing adultery or getting drunk, but they are easily seduced by vanity without recognizing how harmful it is. Lucifer was so beautiful that he became proud. His pride finalized the transformation of Lucifer into Satan. God granted Lucifer his power, authority, beauty, and wisdom, but Lucifer's wrongful attitude turned these gifts into instruments for his own destruction. I am surprised to realize that men and women called and empowered by God still make the same tragic mistake that Lucifer made. Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 15 analyze the reason behind Lucifer's rebellion. Lucifer's longing was to be on the same level as God. He imagined himself so clever, beautiful, and majestic that he supposedly thought, I could be God. According to scripture, Lucifer undermined the loyalty of a third of God's angels and drew them into his rebellion and fall. 
Biblical scholars generally agree that Lucifer was in charge of coordinating praise in heaven. He was a master musician who continues to use music to enchant people to this day. Lucifer was in charge of God's sanctuary in heaven, responsible for religious services. He was the cherub who guarded the place where God's presence manifested. He was responsible for the music. He was a very successful artist. Then he rebelled and fell into vanity. The battle lines are drawn. He was expelled from God's presence after boasting of his wisdom and beauty and after plotting his rebellion against God. His treacherous angels were also expelled with him. Lucifer was perhaps the wisest and most beautiful creature of all God's creatures, but scripture says his heart was lifted up. The fall of Lucifer, Satan, began from within before leading to his downfall. Satan's counterattack, the fallen angel, enemy of God and man, retaliated. He had particular enmity against man for two reasons. First, he could attack God's image in man. You see, man visibly represented God to the rest of creation. Satan could not touch God, but he could wage war against God's own image in man. His delight was to profane that image, destroy it, humiliate it, and to that end, he worked tirelessly. Satan's action aimed to disfigure and degrade the image of God in man, seeking to make man repulsive. He tried to destroy not only the physical image, but also the moral and spiritual character that reflects God. Satan has a special hatred for Christians because through them, God is restored and reflected in the world. His strategy is to try to corrupt and divert Christians from their path, seeking to weaken their faith and compromise their witness. In response to Satan's fall, God did not remain passive. He intervened by sending Jesus Christ, the perfect expression of his image, to redeem and restore humanity through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. His salvation and the opportunity to be transformed into the image of his Son. This transformation is a continuous process in the life of the Christian where we are gradually molded into the likeness of Christ. This happens as we submit to the Holy Spirit and live according to Christ's teachings. By doing this, we reflect God's image more clearly and brightly in a world that is in desperate need of his light and truth. Satan, aware that he cannot destroy God, directs his fury and deceit against humanity, trying to divert people from God and the truth of the gospel. However, the final victory belongs to God. Through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, Satan was defeated, and those who place their faith in Christ have the promise of eternal life and complete restoration to the image of God. This ongoing spiritual conflict between good and evil, between God and Satan, is a central theme in the biblical narrative. It reminds us of the importance of remaining faithful to God and resisting the temptations and deceptions of Satan, knowing that in Christ we have victory and the promise of a glorious future with God. God bless everyone for watching the video. If you liked it and want to see more, please subscribe to the channel, comment your ideas, and don't forget to give that wonderful like.